So yeah, so we are a public meeting. Welcome. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's been such a long time since we saw each other. <laughs> uh, and you know, the really crazy thing is that we would talk about meeting yesterday and I had the housing institute, but then the pink eye that I had a couple weeks ago came back. Oh no. <laughs> ended up staying home yesterday because I didn't want to be in a group of 200 people with pink eye in one home. So I, I was kicking myself like, oh, that's too bad. Shelly, <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, I hope yeah. it gets better quick. If you have, that's I, a drag, have it come back. Yeah, and it's definitely not as worse as it was the first time, but I think maybe I didn't use, I know we're being recorded, but I think I didn't use the antibiotics long enough, maybe, and it wasn't totally gone. I don't know. Uh, Your kid can give it back to you. It's totally, I, I've, I've looked into this. You can get it and then get rid of it and then get it again. And I've, I've never had it ever before, so it's just such a new experience. <laughs> just or, what you wanted to have for your new experience. Yeah, and I'm, we're going to California on Wednesday. Not supposed to. We're going to California on Wednesday, so I'm hoping that I'm not going to scare anyone on the plane. Uh, wow! So you can wear a mask. It's hard to wear it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really. Anyway, so anyway, so here we are. Go last night. It went okay. Yeah, you yeah. Guys, I think yeah. you get through a lot of stuff. You're efficient. So great. Yeah, we finished early. <laughs> No, we did. Wow. I was really I was really pleased by how well received what we had done on that first goal was. Oh good. But there might be a lot of pushback on different things and and there really wasn't. So that was kind of that was kind of great. Oh good. So should we start with um Grover's suggestion around AE and talk that out a little bit more about the um whether it's a revolving fund, whether the language is more around innovative that could be a revolving fund. How, how, how did you hear that and what are your thinking? I heard it as um, she being more comfortable with the focus on being in on innovations. Um, so yeah, but I think we, we could focus on exploring innovations and a revolving fund could be part of that. Or it could almost even be a separate thing. I don't know. I mean, that seems like what its greatest use would be, but if we had a revolving fund that did something that wasn't particularly innovative, I would be okay if it worked with me, so I don't know. But yeah, innovation and any innovation is, should be, innovation should lead. That's fine with me. Yeah, I think the point was, um, not that we do something that no one has ever done before, but we do something that this group hasn't done. That Amherst hasn't really done. Yeah. yeah. Greg, what, what since you really were kind of I, interested? Yeah, in I, I mean, my my thought would be that I, you know, I think Grover offered useful feedback um, on the sort of the the latter half of their feedback around just. They're like, oh, well, the point is innovation and lead with that. And I think that's true, right? And I think like, and, and not innovation for innovation's sake, but but I think sort of like, but I think, and I was never really thinking of a revolving loan fund as the be all end all, more just like something well outside, you know, the standard of what we've been doing, you know? And so I, I'd be happy to sort of see that framed as like, you know, uh, you know, as an example of, of as one possible example of how we might pursue that plank in the plan. And, and not to uh, put words in your mouth, but I remember the first time you mentioned this, I thought it was actually about innovation, the fact that there are small developers and there may be small projects that don't seem economically feasible, but if we tried it, we might actually find out it might be, or it might be very useful for the town of Amherst, for the population that we're looking at. So it is innovation. Well, sure. Yeah. You know, I mean, and, and, and that could, that, that, but that could be through a revolving loan fund. It could be through a grant program. It could be through, you know, like, you know, and, and I think, you know, Grover appropriately anticipated like, that just jumping into something like that wouldn't be advisable, you know, because of the, you know, the various complexities to it. So, but yeah, I think we're kind of all in agreement here. It seems like leading with innovation and 
maybe frame it like, you know, for example, and a revolving loan fund, you know, or small, like small grant program, or, you know, we could even add a couple more examples just to sort of demonstrate that we're not married to one of them. I don't, I guess I don't really see a revolving loan fund as an example of, um, of innovation so much as perhaps something that could support innovation but it doesn't seem like an example of innovation yeah, in and exactly. of itself. So I, so I don't, I don't, I like mostly all the ideas, but I haven't got a framing of it that I like very much yet. And I think there are things about a revolving loan fund that could be valuable that is even not even connected necessarily to, and it'd probably even be connected to innovation for us, like Rob said, because we have certainly never done anything like that before, but revolving loan funds can be very, really powerful. So I don't know. So it seemed to some extent to me worth hanging on to that exploring idea. it, exploring it kind of in its own right. And and maybe it would be good for some if we're gonna do any innovation with small things, it will take something to to get it going. But it doesn't like you said, it could be grants, it could be a loan fund, it could it feel if it, it feels weird to tie them together to me. I I they might work together, but they so what so also might not need to or not even want to which things time which things together carol the idea of innovation, innovation and, a and a revolving loan fund and you're saying that your hope is to maintain explore like the, the specific action of explore the possibility of a revolving loan fund you're hoping to keep that i kind of like that i mean if some if everybody else doesn't i'm happy to blow it off but yeah the place that i worked for a long time had a revolving loan fund that was very important to people. It was a CLT movement, but it was very important. Some people could get loans from that revolving loan fund who couldn't get a loan from a bank. No way would a bank do it because the way the rules are of the bank, and, a, and this was the longest established revolving loan fund, so that's the truth, but it provided funding where there wasn't any. No, there were people who got into homes who without that revolving loan fund would not have. So that's why it speaks to me. And maybe it's a ridiculous thing for Amherst to look into, but anyway. But, but couldn't it be one of the, one of, and I, I think that it could still be an example. I think it could be, what I'm a little bit hung up on is that just going with um, innovation is so vague. And so like, what's the point of the innovation? Is it how we have it here to support small, new construction of affordable housing or converting existing buildings to affordable housing, small developments. Is that what the point of the innovation is? Because if we just do innovation to me, that's way too vague. That's, that's helpful I like feedback. That. I mean, and can, can I respond? I mean, I actually think like, I would name it specifically as, as, as far as I'm concerned, you know, my, my interest, this is the opportunity I see is, um, I'm trying to think of, of, the, of a concise way to, to, to say it, but is to um, is to strengthen the eco the development ecosystem in Amherst, right? And I think I, I have a thesis, and, and that's why I explore and not not do, you know. But my thesis that I want I want to I want to test is that there are some number of entities that might contribute to affordable development. Um, who are currently not, and it's because they're they're not interested in they're not tax credit developers, you know. And and, and I guess I, I'm sort of interested in sort of making sure we maintain a healthy ecosystem outside of maintain and grow a healthy ecosystem outside of Valley and Wayfinders, essentially, who are going to build tax credit projects of mm -hmm. of, of thirty units or more, um, almost exclusively. Um, so. Yeah, so that so to me, like you know, like like in, in, inviting others in, <laughs> and you know, and um, and also maybe complementing, and this gets into the uh, into, I guess, another goal area. But like, you know, if we work on non-conforming lots, or if we try and incentivize duplexes or whatever on a policy side you know, it, it, through advocacy, it would be really cool to be able to say, and we're going to, 
prove how viable duplexes are by funding two or three of them. You know, um, uh, you know, and so like, so that's kind of, you know, but I guess I was, so I guess I was thinking about sort of the ecosystem, both in terms of actors and then also products as well. Um, but, but not, not just products. So I, so if it's really trying to su support and build the eco, the development ecosystem, then, I mean, you might, it might end up finding things like maybe a revolving loan fund, maybe that's the sticking point. It could be needing support with uh, monitoring if it's smaller scale development, like monitoring the affordability, ready rental list, like all that kind of stuff adds costs for small developers. So it might be these kinds of things that, that you're exploring. Uh, and so then that leads me to wonder if like innovation might be a little bit of a grand word for some of those kinds of things, but um, it might, if you're really wanting to support, it's looking at all these different, that, different aspects of development. And if it's smaller scale development, then these certain costs, like, you know, there are costs you have, whether you have 60 units or whether you have five. Mm -hmm. And so some of that can be really prohibitive, particularly if you're not already in the space. So, um, but I still think that a revolving loan fund could be an example of that. Like if you're really wanting to kind of just explore all the steps of kind of the development process and where are their gaps or what's stopping people, then that's that's a pretty interesting goal, I think. It's pretty vague, but I still think that we need to say that it's because we're wanting to support the ecosystem or particularly the capacity, the ability for smaller developments to happen because the larger ones are going to, they're going to be developers that have the capacity, they have the expertise and the capacity. It's really kind of the smaller developers, newer, or ones that you're trying to encourage to get into the affordable space. I think, that, I mean, that's a pretty clear statement. Support smaller scale development, the de whatever that meet, whatever that needs, but that's yeah, the thing that we're trying to support, right? Support smaller, smaller scale development and emergent developers, I think. Okay, is, is, that works for me. Mm -hmm. And I and I I think emergent developers could be defined kind of widely, right? I mean, I think like it could be ACL the, the Amherst Community Land Trust ramping up operations. You know, it could be um, you know it 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 could be some you know it, it, somebody who's doing single family or, or duplex market rate development. You know, like. Maybe we can lure in, lure them into doing something affordable, you know, um, there. And then I know there's, and I know, I also know there's some state stuff to sync with. There's a state emergent developers program, which is specifically anti developers of color. Um, I don't know, like historically marginalized communities. And like, maybe there's a way to sync up with, with that or complement that, you know? Um, uh, so, you know, just to. There's the builders of color association or whatever that, work is being done around trying to support developers of color. There's work, the quasi agencies, MHP is involved in this. Uh, yep. It's collectively working on how do we build the, like the supply chain and the um, capacity of um, developers of color. And MHP now has a line of credit for, it's not just developers of color, but it's structured in a way that it's for smaller scale or well, actually it might be. Anyways, there's a lot of effort going on of trying to acknowledge that Developers of color have had a harder time getting in the field. They have oftentimes, at least smaller, smaller ones have um, less capital, et cetera. So, yeah. okay. So, yeah. So we might glom on to something, a, a bigger initiative and, and and sort of do a local complement to something, you know. Um, yep. And I think I, it's the perfect community to, to do that. Mm -hmm. I realize I have a question that, if we were, if we funded, how, however we fund something that we're calling um, an emergent developer or something like that, if we fund it not with CPAC money, does it have to have all the monitoring and all the stuff from the state? I asked the question because I have some friends who just decided that people didn't have money enough to live anywhere, bought a building, 
renovated it and are charging affordable rents, period. Nothing else is going on. Nobody's monitoring it except them as the landlords. But they made the commitment that we're going to rent these things affordably. They got the financing to do the renovation they had to do. And it's just, I think the building is up in Shelburne, but actually they live here now. Anyway, um, could we help? Could we support something like that? Is there any money that we have that could support something like that? Or does anything that we do have to prove its affordability through time? Because that makes everything cost more. And I'm just, I don't want to not do that with some things, but are we tied to having to do that no matter what? I mean, it, it, it's if they sold the building, then there's nothing that's protecting your investment. So that's kind of the challenge that it's public resources and you need to have a, there needs to be a public benefit because of the anti-aid um, amendment to the constitution. So you can't just give money for private purpose. There has to be a public benefit and that's usually shown by a uh, regulatory agreement that allows that requires affordability or a deed restriction or uh, with rent assistance it's with a um a lease assigned um um agreement with the landlord so it's it's just the issue that you're using public resources and you need to show the benefit and just saying well we know that they're doing the right thing like that's as great as it is i'm not sure that that <laughs> No, I, that's why I'm asking. I'm like, so if if the thing was that um, we were we monitored the rent for some number of years, would that work? I think you'd have to fight your council, town council. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, uh, yes, I know, but I mean, I'm I'm not saying this is necessarily a go. Just is it necessarily uh, cross it off and don't even think about it? That's my. I, I think it's pretty tricky, but it's I'm hearing Nate and your frustration, just how much Litech adds to costs. And Nate's like, can't we just work with a developer that will just do it? And it's, you know, much cheaper because Litech does. I mean, these programs add a lot of costs. It is true. So, yeah, I, I think, think we could do that, but I would get it a restriction. It could be term limited. And then depending on the development, our inclusionary zoning bylaw will capture it anyways. And so, you know, there's probably a few different uh, layers there, but I think it's something we could do, and it could be something that's monitored locally. But at the very least, we would want something, you know, a 15 year restriction or a 30 year DPL with a write down period or something. I mean, there's going to be, you know, we're going to want to exact something for that public benefit. It's not just and like it, a it, handshake. And a, a DPL in this case, what do, you, what do you mean by DPL? Like a, a down payment? A deferred payment oh. loan. So like that. Deferred payment. Right. Yeah. 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 I mean, that's like, um, yeah. I mean, so I think, you know, Carol, like, and, and some of those things would not need to be that onerous for the person on the development, yeah, um, right? you know, I mean, like uh, recording a deed covenant isn't that, I mean, you need, you need an attorney to do it correctly, but I, but it, it, you know, but it, especially if the financing is not super complex on their end. It's the monitoring. It's, yeah, and yeah, it's it's the monitoring, really. You know, is is the um, you know, I mean, and I think the other thing too is the other. I think CPA money we are obligated to point it towards the SHI list. Shelley, is that correct? Um, not no, because CPA can go up to one hundred percent of the area median income, and I think oh. in the eighty. So, in, unless there's something that Amherst adds, look, uh, I mean. Uh, like a lot of communities, including often Amherst, right? Like are very focused on getting things on this SHI list, but but uh, we don't actually, but that, 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 that can make, because what happens then is then you have to have it recorded with, uh, what, what is it? Mass housing or, you know, or they, UHLC. Affirmative for housing marketing. And there's, there's a variety of. Yeah. And so the SHI list is one of the things that adds a lot of the layers of, of of com not complexity, just more stuff to do, yeah. which wouldn't necessarily be required in the case of of what you're talking about. No. I mean, you want to make sure that you're following fair housing and all. Sure. That. Yeah. 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 So it, I'll work a little bit on um, some wordsmithing for one e, if that's okay, to submit to. Yeah. And are, are, do we feel ready to move on to funding or Car Erica? Were you going to say comment? Or? I just wanted to say one other thing. It seems curious to me that. There didn't seem to be a question about public purpose, 
when we put money to keep people in their rental units for this three month period, that was a public purpose. But helping somebody get into some place where we then they have to have a if we're developing it instead of just supporting the rent, it seems more cumbersome. And that was, I'm just making that as a comment and an observation. Nobody has to really say anything unless I'm totally off the wall. You, you mean um, emergency rent assistance during COVID? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that was the emergency of having people homeless or lose their home during a health crisis was, so some things were waived during that time. Yeah, I think probably the difference is helping, helping tenants as opposed to helping a property or a project. And so, I mean, in my mind, you know, HUD allows right up to three months with block rent money for rental arrears and certain things and no more. And to me, I sometimes, you know, like we are putting CPA money we put other funds toward that, but to me, right, you're not actually securing a unit. You're you're supporting a tenancy or a residency. But the idea is, if you actually support a project, you're you're getting the property or the you know the unit, not the person. And so, to me, that's the distinction. And uh, yeah, so I mean, the trust can do you know some of those things. And I guess Shelley, when I was thinking about a private developer, right? I mean, I'm I'm thinking that, for instance, you know, uh, um. You know, like Barry Roberts, for instance, does a lot of products in town and he could he can develop, you know, 60 units faster and cheaper than uh, Wayfinders. Right. And they're, you know, they're going to spend five years before they actually get a project open. You know, it's a town project. Barry would come in, permit it and get it under construction, occupied in two for less of the cost. And so, you know, what my my thought is, if that's the case, you know, do you know, we do have a local um, you know tip essentially for that. But, you know, would the trust ever just buy down units, you know, and or do something because, um, you know, it's not a it's not a, a tax credit project or anything. But you could say, hey, Barry, you know, we want to buy in addition to your inclusion of units or whatever, we're, we want to buy 10 units in your project for a certain amount of money and get, you know, 30 year restriction on it or something. I don't know if you'd want to do that, but it's just some of those ideas because, you know, giving money to wayfinders is great but you know the town project that we've been look, working on it's really going to be like seven years by the time we actually get units on the in you know constructed and occupied where you know if barry's looking at doing you know a project on this property and he's thinking about it now and he wants to move forward with it you know he's gonna move a lot faster and everything and you know he's just an example but to me it's like oh that to me that would be something i'd want to investigate like wow what if we bought down 10 10 units for half a million dollars and we got, you know, 30 year restrictions or something on 10 units. I mean, to me, that'd be worthwhile. It, it could be an interesting model. That's all. Would that fit under E? I think it could. Yeah. Yeah. I, I Yeah. I, everything I hear makes me think E has just got to be not completely oh. Shelly, like you said, everything in the universe, but somehow allow for these, these kinds of thoughts to get a little bit of at least uh, investigation into them. So if we only do it as small, then that kind of limits what some of what Nate's talking about. So let me just give some thought to how we might be able to frame it. Cause I still think that there needs to be some, like you need to be able to articulate this to people in the community and to just make it so vague is really hard to wrap your head around. So let me think about, about that and I'll present some an idea to you. Couldn't, can I just ask, even the thing Nate said, if we bought 10 units, that's the units we're making affordable, even if it's in something that's bigger than that. So isn't that, in a way, our part of the project is 10 units in that, in his example. I don't know. Whatever. Well, and the interesting thing is if, if so you just need to work, can be concerned about procurement. Like you, you would have a hard time as a public entity just going to him and saying, can we buy 10, 10 down 10? Because others didn't know that possibility. So you need to think about that how you would initiate it if he's not coming to you. But if he already has to do inclusionary units, then he already has to have the infrastructure. And so adding 10 more, it's more of a financial, whether he wants to do that, but it's, he already has to have that infrastructure, which is interesting versus going to someone who has a small apartment building that's like 10 units and they don't know anything about managing affordable housing. That's a way different. To me, that's much more complicated to ask them like to buy down two units or four units versus someone who already has to do it. So. Anyway, so I'll work on that one. And if we can funding, people are ready to do that. 
Nate, I just sent you the most recent um, goals, by the way. Oh, thanks, Greg. I was looking at an older one, I think. So with Lincoln, there were a couple of questions that really needed to be considered a bit. And I don't know if, I don't even know if we did kind of a to-do list or if anyone's done. Kind of, yeah. And I, I have some information. Uh, <laughs> there's very little uh, short-term rental fees uh, uh, getting captured, you know, somewhere in the, probably the immediate short-term total is probably like 15, 20 grand. 20 is probably wildly high annually. Um, wow. I think so it's, it's still pretty small. How is that possible in a community like Amherst? You don't have that much short-term rental kind of activity. I mean, I guess not. I mean, I guess, I mean, it, 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 and, and keeping in mind, just, a, you know, it's a 3% tack. It's not the whole, you know, but it's, uh, we get it reported through, you know, if someone's registered with like VRBO or Airbnb or something. So a lot of rentals may just be a private owner renting and we're not, you know, they don't have to disclose that in a way that we're probably getting the tax. And right. I mean, yeah. I'm assuming there's like some. Probably a few, but most of those, they're probably just renting to students, you know, for, for on a lease. But yeah, I mean, I think it's if anybody who's using the RBO or Airbnb is paying the, you know, the, the tax or whatever, but there's a, um, there's a, uh, there's a state reporting, um, on, on the Department of, of Revenue or one of the or local services, maybe there, I found a, you know, and I think like 2024 20, is maybe on track to be like 15,000 or 20,000, something like that. So A is probably not a option to get any short term and has its meaningful. Not, not at this time. I mean, unless, unless something changed in that, you know, like uh, unless some i can't imagine how i would get well one of the things that means is now is the time to set it up so that if it ever gets meaningful it will be Maybe. there won't be so many people objecting to it right i'm like well, seriously four million over five years yeah really four hundred thousand a year and twenty twenty thousand to ten percent of that that's a chunk well, well that interesting the, the Interestingly, too, I found that the state enabling legislation says that 35% of the, there's 3% and then the extra 3%, and it's the extra 3% we're talking about here. 35% of that is supposed to be directed to infrastructure and affordable housing. Um, so it might just be good housekeeping because it's not that much money right now to say, hey, can we just start, you know, I don't know, paying my salary with it or something, you know, or I, or I don't know what would be a, 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 a clean. Well, give us the 35% of the 3%. It's supposed to be for housing or infrastructure and we need it for housing. So or should we just ask, ask for all of it? Huh? Or just ask for all of it. Well, wh whatever. Yeah. Give us. Anyway, I think it would be useful to try to pursue. I think that's a useful goal to try to get that sorted so that we just get that money, even though it isn't that much. Every yeah. little bit helps. Yeah, I thought I thought we would get it when we were discussing this, you know, a few years ago, I thought some of it was going to come to the trust, but I think it just go. I think it, I don't think it does. I, um, you know, it's just, it's, I don't know if it goes, I don't know if it goes to the general fund or like an enterprise fund. So I think Greg, you had, to talk, you had asked Holly, maybe we have to have a follow-up meeting and, it probably is with like end up being with the town manager's office to determine like how they are allocating those funds. Yeah. yeah I, so I, the goal could, it, could at least start with finding out what in the heck is happening now and see if we can't direct it towards, I think it's a useful goal. Okay. And so do you want to request a hundred percent of the additional 3% or the 35? 100%. 100%. Okay. Yeah, better to compromise from there than somewhere else. Okay, so I will um, read the um, state statute and get the language so that it reflects that, whatever the additional, whatever that language is, I'll, I'll look that up. And then Greg, if you would do a little bit more work of asking about 
fourth one now. Sure. Yeah. And I just Nate, did I see see you on the so I never heard back from Holly after I uh, so maybe Nate, we can chat offline about the best way to um, get some of that data back from Yeah, I think it's another email. I know she's busy. Um yeah, she it's has probably time some of my emails. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so can we move on? Yeah. What's oh. that noise? Uh probably the oh, lawnmower. Is it rain in the, in the rain? Rain. Dedicated lawnmower, I'd say. You missed my comments. I had hoped my husband would stop mowing the lawn when it rained, but he is stubborn. So it's raining in Amherst right now? Yes. Really? In some parts of it. It rained here a little, but it isn't now. It's very iffy. Well, that's probably why he's still doing it. See, I do half and he does half, so he's getting ready for me to do the other half. <laughs> okay, so funding B. The B is seek a yearly CPA contribution from the town, working toward an automatic 10% recommended transfer. We still feel okay with that? C, work toward the- And, and so I guess, I guess, you know, I know other towns do this automatic transfer and that is, like, is that, um, but is that an annual vote then still with council or like, is it, does it become a, like a town policy so that it doesn't get voted on every year or does it still have to get voted on every year? Probably. Right. Yes. It has to be voted on, but it, the hope is that the CPC would just add that to their recommendations without making the trust um, apply every year and justify it. And so it's trying to get into a pattern where they just make the recommendation to transfer 10%. That's okay. the hope to get to that point. I think, and I, and I have not yet gotten been able to track down those numbers, but, um, but I, the thing, the thing we were going to talk about though, is, is the number 10 too low because the sort of, uh, you know, the, the, the cyclical, like they, I think they're probably well above 10% every year right now. Right. Is that, in, in in the sort of granted it, it, in response to our our application to them but aren't, aren't they kind of doing a bit more than that every year more than 10 percent to the trust so this year trust, we got... maybe more to affordable housing we want 10 percent to the trust Without... i think we're going to more than 10 percent to the trust aren't we Nate, Nate, you, I mean, you might be yeah i mean it, it... Yeah, I mean, it's hard because, you know, there's debt service and everything. So, but we are getting more than 10%. I, I do think it, um, I like the goal. I mean, maybe we increase it, but the percentage, but it'd be nice to um, have some I number guess. in there that just, you know, to me, it would, be, it would seem, you know, essentially it becomes like a debt allocation every year. They just back it out of the pot when they get the money. So, you know, Amherst gets 1.8 million and 1.5 to 2 million every year. There's a half million and debt service every year. And so like, you know, one to 1.2 million available. And so to me, it would just be like, okay, you know, we take a certain number that just gets taken out right away. Um, but I, you but, definitely want to do the math to see if you're, if the trust is already getting more than 10%, we don't want to ask for less. So right. definitely do the math and let's put that at a percentage that's more realist, consistent or realistic or an average or something. Right. All right. So yeah. So Nate, Nate and I will work on a number okay. that would would represent a stretch. But I think the question I have in that, and Nate, you might weigh in here, or others. Actually, Carol and Erica, you're from, and Rob too, because you've been around. <laughs> Actually, you've all been on these committees. Like, so let's say we let, let's say we were successful in getting, say, fourteen or sixteen percent or whatever. You know. <sighs> But then some years, I think, you know, like last year, we got like probably 25% of their allocation, right? I think last year we got like 500. Um, I think we got 300,000. No, it ended up to be, we asked for five, we got three, I think. Yeah. And the, yes. And the most recent one or the one before that? No, for the most, most recent. recent one. The one yeah, we don't have yet. Yeah, they wanted us to do 250 and we said, no, we do 300. But we asked for 500. Every year we asked for 500. Okay. Because I guess what I'm wondering is like, what if, I, I don't want to end up in a situation where, where 
we have an annual allocation and then we're asking for money on top of that. Does that get sticky? Well, I think so. First of all, so Nate, with the when the ten percent for each category is figured out, is that after debt service is taken off? No, no, debt service is factored in. So I was thinking we should put ten. We should make the 10, 15 percent. So that's and, off of the one point eight million, regardless of debt service. Yeah, I think we should do fifteen percent to the trust. That's that's the goal. Okay. So, I mean, if we're getting if we're getting two or three hundred thousand every year. I'm taking it out of the full pot. We're at like 12% anyways, you know? So to Greg's point, the, the the hope is that the trust would be able to get to a point where you can do some planning because you know that every year you're going to get about $400,000 or whatever, whatever, you know, 10%, whatever it is, or 12%. So I don't think that that should preclude the trust from being able to, if you have an additional kind of something that comes up or that you want to do to go to the, to file an application. And to ask for more for something specific, I don't, I don't think that should. Hopefully, you'll have the relationship with the CPC where you'll still be able to do that. But the, the hope is that you'll, the trust will get to a point where you can, you'll just have funds you can count on where you can just better plan and anticipate. That's that's kind of the hope is to get, in for me, that's the hope that trusts get to that point. So that's the the point in, in requesting a a set amount um, each year. Yeah. So you I'm, can. Yeah, I would say up to 15% and it's out of the full amount, you know, so if it's $2 million a year, it's 300,000 and that just gets, you know, treated like debt service. So let's, like, how about, should we pencil in then? And then, and then I, I will do some work and nudge Nate if, if need be in getting data that, and if the data matches up with 15%, Great, and if if not, we'll bring it back to this group and, and tweak it. Yeah, I think there'd be a great advantage in having something that we knew was gonna happen each year instead of having to write the sort of the same thing over every time, even though it's a little bit different because you can't make it quite exactly the same. It's- and I, uh, I, and I think it probably, upon reflection, I think it probably is a good time for us to memorialize this to seek to memorialize this over the next couple of years as a policy, you know, in that in five or six years, you know, we could have a new town manager. We'll have a totally new CPA committee. We'll have a, you know, like who knows, right? Like, um, you know, uh, so I think the, the idea that this, that, that this could survive major transitions that are always on, on, and we, we can't really anticipate what those are, you know, um, but like get to a precedent point of precedent so that it's yeah yeah now what is there is that just, just as an informational question isn't there some percentage that cpa is kind of required to have go towards housing stuff and 10 is what 10%. Yeah. yeah i mean the, the town you know we i think like for the last five, six years, we get to 10% for housing just on debt service alone, right? So we borrowed 1.25 million for Rolling Green, which we're almost done with. We had, you know, 350,000 for the housing authority. We had half a million for Valley. We did whatever. I mean, so every year we're writing off, you know, a few hundred thousand dollars for debt service for housing. And so it's just, you know, we don't even have, yeah. So I, I think that's fine. I, um, you know, I think the point being why we'd say the housing trust is that statutorily we're, you're able to bank CPA money in a housing trust, right? The state law allows that. And so that's, to me, that's the reason why. And then, you know, we have other reasons why in terms of how the trust can um, act at different time periods throughout the year and stuff. But I think it's important that it's a recognized place to, to do it. You know, if this were, if the state law didn't say it, I wouldn't feel as comfortable, but I feel like other communities do it and it's allowed. And so that's where I would, you know, make the case that this is a thing that's, you know, it's not unique to Amherst. Yeah. Okay, so let's on the percentage a little bit more, but the idea, it mm -hmm. sounds like we're still in agreement with. Yeah. So C is work toward the implementation of a real estate transfer fee with the majority of the revenue being allocated to the trust. So a little bit vague, but how are we feeling about this one at this point? I think it's important, but it uh, doesn't look like the state's going to pass it, but I still think it's really important to keep pushing for it. 
not this year, maybe next year, maybe we have five years. <laughs> I don't think it's, I mean, the, they're around the state. I don't think the state has given up on it. I mean, that whole, whatever it is, LOHA, I forget what it stands for. They've been pushing for it and pushing for it and they're not gonna stop because it's not passing this year. I, I still think it's a, it's an important, it's important. It's not only a good idea from the revenue point of view, it feels to me like an, it's important because those people who buy all those high-end houses ought to be putting something into other people living in their community. It's kind of an ethical thing to me as well as a money thing. Okay, so we'll keep that. And then, and I think that your board will um, be responsible to that. And then D, so we have a couple here that are a little bit less measurable than what I typically try to encourage, but so explore updating the inclusionary zoning in lieu of formula to increase resources for the trust. Nate, do you have I'm almost, I'm almost, I, I, you know, I feel like, I don't know if that should be one, I, you know, it's, it's an option already and I'm not sure like how much more we're gonna get out of inclusionary zoning. I don't know how this feel, but I mean, if we're looking at an active kind of uh, revenue stream, I mean, we already just changed, you know, the bylaws recommended to be changed anyways. I'm not sure like what we're thinking about doing there. Um, how is it structured or how is it updated? Is it updated? Is it, does the bylaw direct it to be updated periodically or how does that work? Mm. We talked uh, about last night, actually, Shelly, I think before you joined. Um, I see. Uh, but so, yeah, there is some consideration. I, and I don't know if anybody, if, if Nate, if any other boards have had any formal consideration of that. No, I mean, I think the planning board, you know, wanted some guidance. You know, they just reviewed a project and, and uh, approved a payment in lieu. But, you know, we, staff was saying that you could ask for more. I think developers actually willing to give more, but there was some concern that the bylaw wasn't flexible enough. And so essentially we changed the language, but there's no, you know, requirement that it be periodically updated. I think the, um, you know, and, and the idea is that we'd want to get the units on the ground. So, you know, the inclusionary zoning has a payment in lieu if there's so many units provided and so many are on site or, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I don't know if we want to tweak that a lot or if we, you know, I mean, I feel like, but you know, it's a kind of a case by case basis. I don't, I don't want to see that every time there's an inclusionary project that the trust gets somehow gets money that would mean loss of units. I, I don't know. I'm just don't know if that's a if we'd want to put that as one of our kind of objectives, if, or if we want to think of another one. Because the town prioritizes the units being built in in the development. I don't think it's listed under. Is it listed under funding? It is. Yeah, it is. Yeah, I don't I don't like that. <laughs> we're not gonna build units, we're gonna make money. Forget it. Right. The way the way you would increase revenues is by lowering lowering the mandate. Well, there are a lot of things easier here. to be money. Yeah, I mean if the goal was funding the trust, then then the, the concrete strategy, yeah, like perhaps that would be to lower the number, which we don't want to do. When there are there are IZ programs that when it's a smaller development and it would only create one or two units that they allow in lieu of because just the, the economics of having just one or two units. So there are programs where it makes sense, but if that doesn't make sense for Amherst, then that's that's fine. It just means that we need to try to find another way to make money in Amherst for your, for your board. I mean, if it's- well, not, yeah. I was gonna say the language already exists. And so exactly. there is that opportunity already there. Um, and it was the first time that we actually had to have this ethical conversation in the trust in terms of uh, taking in lieu versus those units. And it was actually a very, very deep conversation and it made sense for this particular project. And it was good to know that it does not set precedent. Um, so I think, you know, the group really has to think deeply, including we also got at least one outside feedback regarding um, the decision. So. Um, I think that already exists, so I don't know about exploring anymore. <laughs> I mean, what if, I agree. What if instead of saying updating language, what if it was like, you know, strategic implementation of the payment and lieu option or or something? Because I do think, you know, the trust could consider it for a number of projects, and so 
I, you know, cause I don't know how much we're going to keep updating the language, you know, in terms of trying to get a, that revenue stream, but the use of it is more kind of what I see the trust doing in the next few years. I mean, I, I agree with Shelly. I mean, you know, we have a product that had one affordable unit, you know, it's like, you know, is that, you know, maybe it's important or maybe it's like, you know, the trust could get 400,000 and say, you know what, we'll, with the rest of our funding, we can leverage that actually. And we'll, you know, we'll, we're going to get like 10 units out of it. If we put in another few hundred thousand, you know, we can give someone three quarters of a million and we're going to get 30 affordable units in perpetuity as opposed to one unit. Um, and just so our gene monitoring one unit, like just all that stuff that there are cases where it could make sense. So I don't, but the, but the language is there. We're talking about maybe making the language so that there's more room for the planning board to move in and it has a little more direction about what it's supposed to be thinking about. And that doesn't seem like it needs to be part of any of these goals because we're doing it right now. And so I don't, I don't know. I don't, I don't see that. And it, yeah, Does I don't. I think we should get rid of the goal. Um, I mean, the strategy, I, I actually, I mean, I think we're the language that is going to give us the ability to uh, have that flexibility to think through in lieu of is already in process. It's in the pipeline. I don't think there's any further value to it. And it, it also it doesn't seem like it would, how would it come to us to be, I guess we could advocate for it. If a project comes up and we know there's a, pro, and a project that's going to use inclusionary zoning, we could decide all ways to have an opinion on whether it should be in lieu or not, but it's not, we could have an opinion and pass it on to the planning board who has to decide, I guess, but. Well, a lot of it just depends on how your bylaws written. So like Swamp Scott is a community where they say, if it's this many units or below, it can be in lieu of, and this is over and it should be built within it. And the trust is actually given the charge to determine what the payment is. So it uh, really depends on how your how your bylaws written and what the role of the trust is and how it works. But if if you feel comfortable with how it is working now, then I think that we should just remove it. Yeah, I, I'm okay with that. And I actually want to echo Nate. You know, not not to go backwards. Maybe we can just come back to this another time. I don't think we should go back into development goals right now. But where there's actual work for the trust to do is in figuring out how to deploy those monies um, expeditiously and effectively. Um, because I think one, I think it sort of exposes us, like we don't have that money yet for that first project, but um, like once we do, if we sit on it for too long, that might be problematic. You know, like we, we you know, I, I think, that doesn't look great. So I think our, our to do is to figure out like what's the best way to spend those funds. Um, you know, I think that could, that could conceivably come under develop or development goals or it could be in a work plan too. It doesn't have to be on this document, but. The, um, yeah, Shelly, just quickly, I think, I don't know, after the discussion with inclusionary zoning. So right now the way the bylaws are written is that it's up to the permit granting authority, which is usually the ZBA or, perm, or planning board to determine if there's a payment in lieu and the trust would be advisory, but may not even be, um, you know, referred to or asked. So I don't know. I mean, would it still be worth it in that strategy to say, you know, advocate for or consult with permit board for, you know, and so it's still like an active thing that, you know, to me, it's like we would take this and actually send it around to different boards and committees once the statement is these goals and, and are done and really, and just, you know, so every time there's a project, we could say, you know, the trust want, you know, the trust has a role in it. And I think that maybe calling it out that way is important. Um, just so that it's, you know, the trust, you know, it, it's a statement saying we want to be active in that kind of discussion or review and not, not that with the trust wouldn't be, but I just, I don't know if it's still worthwhile to have it in there. Right. Because what if, you know, in the next year, there's six projects that have inclusionary zoning requirements and does the trust want to, you know, see what, where, what does that mean, right? Like, would we actively look at those and say, okay, maybe there is one where we take, and it doesn't have to be a full payment, right? It doesn't have to be for, it can be for like one unit instead of three, if, you know, it could be, you know, some kind of partial payment. So I, I just, I don't know if it's worth it having some language in there about, 
you know, collaborating on the use of the fee with the permit granting authority, but something about like just still having it in there as a kind of an active thing the trust would be doing. Well, then it should be rewritten. Um, it's yeah. not, actually, yeah. Um, I mean, the way it's written, what we need to do, I would say, is to advocate um, that the trust is uh, consulted uh, on uh, projects that are inclusionary zoning, including, uh, or especially uh, if there's a consideration of in lieu, something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 no, agreed. I think that's where I was thinking it would be. How do people feel about that? I like that idea. I think there are inclusionary zoning projects that happened while I was on the trust that I didn't even know about until they were done and built and somebody told me there were units in them. I like that seems kind of, I would like to not have that keep happening that way. Agree. I mean, I guess maybe the question that's surfacing here is, is there an eventual scenario or potential eventual scenario where we're encouraging developers to use the fee in lieu? No. So it sounds like not necessarily, but there may be cases where it's appropriate or it, it economically. It seems appropriate that we should be, we should know that it's happening and have the opportunity to say something if we so choose. That's that's what I want. I don't want to necessarily say we're going to try to get it. I just want the opportunity to look at it. So basically, you know, so maybe the, the sort of strategy is, you know, monitor market rate development subject to the inclusionary zoning bylaw and engage as appropriate when in lieu fees are a possibility. No, in lieu fees are kind of always a possibility, are they not? I mean, it, so well, I'm I, just I, saying if there if there's a project that has inclusionary zoning units, mm -hmm. I would like the trust to be informed and have an opportunity to present a, an opinion if it has one. Is that okay. a, a, I mean, I guess so, I'm going to shut up. <laughs> well, I, the thing, I, the, the thing I think that's because the, the developer is the one. So as things stand right now, right, like the developer proactively comes to the town and says, I have an inclusionary obligation and I'd like to and I'd like to to instead of that, provide an in lieu fee. And then a big dialogue happens in the town, which is what happened last time. But when there's just an inclusionary obligation and their stated intention is to build the units, I don't actually know, nice to be in a loop, but I don't know like how, what, what our role would be in influencing that process at all, other than to sort of be advocates at ZBA or the planning board. Yeah, but I think that to Carol's point, you don't always even know that it's happening. So if exactly. you're the board that's supposed to be increasing the supply of affordable housing, like it's really problematic to me if you don't even know when that's happening outside of your work. So. I think to try to figure out some language, someone used, I don't know if it was Nate or, or Erica that used the word collaborate with the planning, um, the permitting board. But let's try to, I'll try to think of some wordsmithing that's not uh, like aggressive to it, but that's just that you're wanting to be a partner in this, that you wanna be this is your charge, you, you wanna be supportive and that it's not just about in lieu of, although that that's part of the conversation as well. Sure. Okay. Yeah, I mean, we don't want it to get adversarial or them to feel like it's our, this is no, our- No, not at all. Just like, yes, right. You want to, you're in partnership or something. Okay. So if we're- Yeah, I mean, sorry, just to jump in. I, I think Shelly, it was interesting. You said some communities, it's the trust decision whether there's a payment. And right now we put it with our regulatory boards, you know, and so, you know, maybe eventually we'd want to change that. And so I think just, you know, having that some, like whether it is collaborate or something, and maybe in the future, you know, what we see is uh, it's better positioned with the trust to make that decision um, because, you know, the planning board, um, you know, wanted to see what the trust would say, but then some members kind of 
have their own ideas. And it just, you know, it becomes this funny situation where the trust could recommend something that the planning board doesn't uh, actually follow through with. And so then you have, you know, a disagreement and um, anyways, you know, what if the trust, you know, thinks it's important to get some fees because right, there's a, you know, there's a way to leverage that in a way that planning board members aren't really aware of or aren't considering. And so, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so if we're trying to raise $4 million over five years, it looks like we have a gap. So we're probably gonna have to do a little bit of work about thinking about another funding source. And a time check? Uh, yeah, time check, four minutes left. Right, um, yeah, so. I don't know how uh, pie in the sky this is, but um, it seems that the municipality sometimes gets funds such as ARPA and um, I think we've had very, very little influence uh, in getting some of that ARPA into affordable housing. I know the VFW is um, part of uh, what has been supported, but I'm wondering if they, if if there are federal grants that come, that why couldn't some of it be a percentage automatically go to affordable housing? Is Paul the best person to have that conversation with, do you think? Well, I would want to know from Nate what the nays would be before having a conversation with Paul. Yeah, I mean, typically the, I'm, and I'm trying to think like, you know, ARPA was a, you know, there's, there was um, era money, you know, redevelopment. So I, I feel like maybe in those instances, but otherwise it's like, you know, federal money is specific to like, you know, police or schools or something. Yeah. So it's not, you know, it, to me, it would be more like if there's, um, you know, certain pro federal programs or executive orders for funding. I, you know, I don't know. How, you know, we'd have to. Um, I think we could say that. I, I, um, but I, you know, I don't. Otherwise, it's really it's program specific. It's not. Is our opioid money program, Nate? Uh, some of it is. I don't know if all of it is. You can use it for housing. So you can use it for individuals in recovery to get into housing. Um, <laughs> there you go. Maybe that's the thing. Too. Yeah, there you go. Yes. I heard about a low threshold shelter they're trying to build over on Main Street. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I, I'm wondering if it isn't. So um, we may be getting five hundred thousand uh, dollars to do some planning with uh, the municipality for municipal property, maybe Ooh. from Representative Dom. Um, but I think you know, are there opportunities that we might be missing out on? Uh, by one, not being aware of some of the funding that comes that could possibly be supportive of a specific population that's focused on, let's say, veterans or people with uh, in recovery, et cetera, um, that we can, you know, push towards affordable housing? Or are there opportunities that um, we might partner with in terms of grant writing? I want, I want to say something just to clarify something. At least my understanding from Mindy is that that $500,000 is in the bond bill, which means like everything else in a bond bill, it isn't going to go anywhere unless some proposal is made to appropriate it. And then that has to be fought for and won. So it's a long ways from being money yeah. in the bank. That's all. Yeah. And the same thing is true of the two uh, things that are included in there for the Housing Authority. Yeah, that was my 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 reaction, Erica. To be clear, I, is that like th that money may happen sometime, but we, we certainly shouldn't plan on when. Um, it's not like a budget appropriation that will show up in July. So, does Amherst ever transfer any free cash to the trust? I no. don't. I don't think. No. Never heard of that. Oh. No. No. Do you see that no possibility of that? Uh, probably not. Amherst is we have, we have pretty we have a big free cash, but we use it pretty actively as you know, like a grants reimbursement account for a number of things. And so it's not um, you know, I think there is always a balance, but the I mean we use it to support enterprise funds and a number of things, and every year, you know, it's a pretty big deal to balance it out, but um, we're pretty active with our free cash. And the town is, or at least my understanding of town finances is, 
It may seem like a rich town, but it really doesn't have enough money to do all the things that it needs to do and is trying to do. And so I don't know. I don't see these things going much of any place because the tax base is pretty much maxed out. People are leaving because they can't pay the taxes. There isn't really another particular source of funds for the town. It's just this, uh, the, the town is between a rock and a hard place with its own finances it, it, independent of this. So tax rate is insane. Hey, yeah. you know, Nate. Do you have any tax? Is there any property that the town owns that could be sold and the income could go to the trust? We've looked at, uh, was it um, that property that we're talked about for the longest time, Strong Street? Strong Street, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the town owns some uh, municipal land and uh, there's some discussions about what to do with it, but it's interesting. Yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, I, I think Rob had the idea actually of selling a lot or two on Strong Street. And, you know, there's some other properties. I, I've kind of had the same idea. It's like sell something for, you know, $200,000 and let, you know, someone build a home or duplex on it. But, you know, it's, it actually is, you know, it's like the cost and time for the town to do something with, you know, we own, we do own some um, odd properties around town. Um, we looked into it a while ago, I guess we could re we could reassess it. I think the town's a little more aware of that. So, you know, um, in the CPA, proposal this year we mentioned you know a few different town owned properties that we look at for housing cost you know possibilities um it, the town doesn't own a ton uh to be honest but any rich people that might donate a lot i was wondering about the donation thing <laughs> yeah i mean we haven't i mean you know it's amazing to me still hearing that people will line up to donate land for conservation and, you know, sometimes Dave and I say, well, you know, how do we start inserting, you know, uh, and housing or something? Because it might not be in the appropriate location, but, um, you know, it's just interesting to me that someone will have like 10 acres and they're like, oh, I'd love to donate it for conservation land. And it's like, well, I mean, if it's connected to other pieces or it's near areas of environmental, you know, concern or sure. Otherwise it's like, you know, 10 acres isn't really a, yeah, spectacular. Yeah. Yeah. Well, subdivide, you know, two or four acres for housing, if it made sense. Right. right. So I want to be sensitive to the time that's 12.04 now. Um, and this we're not gonna solve this in, in the next couple minutes. So I think we need to do a little bit more thinking on this. And um I'll do some wordsmithing on the few of these strategies and get them to you. Um, I'm gonna be out for about a week at toward the end of the month. Um so I think we just need to think about can we tighten up the funding, what we have. I mean, maybe part of it is going back to the full board and seeing if anyone else has additional ideas. It, it might take us a while to really feel like we're building this out enough to get you to the $4 million, but um, I think we made some good progress today. Yeah, I think so, too. And I do think that we probably should ask the rest of the team. Maybe they have some ideas. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, we're talking about like four million in the bank account. I mean, I feel like there's ways to leverage funding, but it's not, you know, necessarily coming to the trust. Do we have a next? Just I, so I don't get it screwed up again. Do we have a next meeting time for this group? Um, I think that is July eighteenth. Shelley, past, past our meeting date. Yeah, July eighteenth. Which yeah. is normal. Normally, we do these after our monthly meeting. So your meeting is the eleventh. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So we don't have another one before before our meeting, but we have, you know, we've we've I think we've made some progress here, and we can bring some of the questions that we still have to the whole group on the eleventh. So let's see if we can do the kind of the wordsmithing of these ones. Yeah. Email, so that at least the funding category could be presented on the eleventh, and some discussion. Is that feel comfortable to folks? That sounds good. 18th, sure. in the 18th, we can do any follow up to that and then really dig into the education and public engagement one. For sure. Just so you know, on the 18th, I'm going to be on a cruise. So I may give you my comments before I go. That's a good well, idea. Don't try to do it from your cruise. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
Love it. Um, can can Shelly, I'm sorry, can Erica and Carol stick around for a second to do some scheduling for uh, another thing? Yep. Okay. Great to see you. Thank you so much, Shelly. Thanks, Rob. Bye-bye. Take care, Thanks, everyone. Hi. So I, I was just looking at the calendar. So our next meeting of which we would do before our monthly meeting is the 4th of July. Um, yep. Um, and I wonder if either of you might be available the 5th of July. Yep, I am. Looks okay so far. Or the 3rd. Okay, so I'll, how about I just move it to uh, Friday the 5th at 11? Does okay. that sound good? Yep. Okay. At 11. Okay. Thursday. Um, um, so, uh, yeah, and Nate and Dave... They may come, they may not. We still should I'm meet. Gonna, but I'm just going to send it and hopefully they'll be, uh, they'll yeah. be amenable. Yeah. Um, if, if maybe you can um, have Dave give us a little bit more about um, Hickory Ridge. Uh, I mean, I think that's such a good option for building. I mean, as you said, if we get the million, we have to think about, you know, different initiatives. And that may be, you know, definitely yeah. something. That yeah, a thing, you know, and it's funny, these meetings get, you know, it's, Time, time evaporates so quickly, but like I, I'm probably, you know, anticipating a, a, a very wonderful problem to have, but like the thing I'm looking forward to is, you know, fast forward six, you know, I guess he needs a CFO. So maybe we'd have, I don't know, within a year. I'm, point being the, the scenario I want to anticipate is we get a million dollar check or 1.2 or whatever it is from Barry and then a month later, if we have to make a CPA application, you know, they're going to look and, you know, they're going to, they're not going to be very interested in funding us. Right. And I, so, but point being, but if we, but probably a public policy best practice would be to have some sort of general intention around in Luffy's like ready to go, you know, um, even if it wasn't a specific project yet, but if we could maybe just sort of like think conceptually about it, potentially, I think there are some less, some fewer limitations on those dollars um, than there are in the, uh, uh, the CPA dollars. So I don't know, but that's a, that was a wrinkle I've been thinking about. One of the, th one of the things that seems to me like it'll be a great advantage of having regular CPA money, is we could do something we have never done before, which is try to have some more of a 